uh, yeah, this is Andres Rodriguez. I'm the founder and CTO of the company. Stephen, thank you for your kind words at the beginning. Uh, Ray and others, it's a pleasure to see you guys again. It's been it's been way too long. Um, let me, you know, let me before before we go into um, the the details and how things are in the current environment. I just want to bring everyone back to what's what's the core intellectual property of the company, the thing we started the company more than ten years ago, and the thing that continues to be a source of differentiation for everything we do. We have a file system that exists entirely in the object store layer. That means all of the data, all of the metadata, versioning information, all that you need to have a file system data structure exists entirely in the object store layer. That allows us to get some pretty amazing things. The scale, the immutability of the versions, and the sharing across you know, large numbers of locations of massive amounts of data. That's what our customers buy the system for. That is the thing that we, and everything you're going to see today, have kept building upon um, to really provide, you know, when we walk into an account, we come in as the file system strategy for that company. We come in and we say, we can handle everything from high performance NAS storage to a branch office, to synchronization of files across locations, uh, to operating workloads that are only in the cloud. And so it's a very general purpose solution. What ties it all together is this file system that exists in the object storage layer. And Stephen, I'm sure you remember from when we started, and I think for years after, to this day, you know, pretty much everyone involved in high performance storage has thought of the object storage layer, whether it's private or public, as a slow, archival you know afterthought of storage we came from that object storage background before we started the company and we always saw it as the primary storage tier and then thinking backwards how do you expose that at high levels of performance when iops and low latency is the thing that the application or the end users need so we really have an upside down way of thinking about the world that puts the object store at the center of the equation and then the appliances are kind of the appliances. And as you're going to see today, the other tools and access mechanisms that we're building for getting to the file system in the object store are sort of the, the satellites, the moons that move around that center core file system that's in the object storage layer. Um, that's architecturally the best way to understand how the, how the company's offerings are different from pretty much everyone else in the space. Um, so with that, Tom, let's get to the use cases, because I think this is good to your point, Ray. You know, when we come into one of these large accounts, we essentially take over all the unstructured data. So, you know, if it's block storage, if it's a database, if it's an ERP system, that's going to go to a high performance block storage array. But everything else, right, everything else that is unstructured data the work product of that company, the design files, the analytics, all of that stuff is going to land with Nasuni. Our broad use cases are the basic NAS file server consolidation. So this is kind of your basic, you know, I've got 200, you know, Windows file servers or 200 NetApp appliances, and I need to bring all that to the cloud, but not only that, simplify the environment. We allow for that to happen, right? That means you have to have the performance. That means you have to have the backup, the data protection integrated with it. That means you need to be able to manage, you know, you may be able to collapse the number of endpoints from 150 to 60, but you still need to manage lots and lots of different access points to the system, different appliances. Uh, so you want central management of everything there. Cloud modernization, we're gonna see a lot of that today, how we hook cloud-based tools for analytics through bridges that we built to the file system in the cloud directly. I think that's some pretty exciting stuff. Um, file collaboration, right? This is classic. I wanna be able to create a share, but instead of being stuck to a share in one location, I want that share to be shared across multiple geographies, multiple locations. Um, I think that one is exciting. I think it was, um, maybe Enrico, so someone brought it up. You know, I think if you're talking about office workloads, I think SharePoint or Teams can be a great tool for that. We enable, you know, that kind of workload for sharing. We enable the integration as well to the to the SaaS world. But we, more importantly, 
allow companies to synchronize very heavy workloads, as in hundreds of terabytes to petabytes that need to be synchronized across multiple locations. That's the sort of collaboration, file synchronization that is very, very, it's impossible to do with a SaaS framework. You need infrastructure. You need this sort of performance and scale that comes from infrastructure to enable that. Um, DR, ransomware mitigation, I'm sure you guys have been hearing a ton about this since the whole pandemic started. We have helped, you know, the fact that our file system in every one of, you know, every deployment of Nasuni has an immutable, infinite number of versions where every time the system takes a snapshot, that gets frozen in time. And we're typically taking those snapshots every five minutes. So, you know, some of our clients that are a decade old, they have millions of snapshots in the system so they can time travel anywhere they want in those 10 years and recover a file, a directory structure, or a full volume. We tie those immutable snapshots that live in the object store with an audit trail that identifies every event that happens against the file system. When what that gives us together is an ability to recover from ransomware almost immediately, and not to a particular point in time, but to actually reproduce the ransomware profile and reverse the effect of the ransomware on a per file basis. So much more granular than if you had to go back you know, 12 hours because that's when you took the last backup or some horrible thing like that. So file backup and recovery, recover with that. Uh, and then finally, remote work, which is what I want to talk uh, about these this next uh, use cases, which is essentially opening up new ways of being able to access your enterprise file system. Like, what are the benefits of, you know, one of the greatest benefits of being able to have the file system in the object store is that the file system is the thing that's really big. That's the center of gravity. You know, that's the thing that has, that's heavy to move, heavy to protect, just very, very large. If you take that out of the hardware, out of the appliances, that enables you to have appliances that are very compact, very lightweight. This is what Tom was talking about before. And so one of our key benefits, especially if people have migrated more and more workloads to the cloud, is the fact that our appliances are really optimized to do one thing and one thing only, serve IOPS to the front end. Therefore, they can run very compact, very small storage footprints, but very high performing storage footprints. And you can move them around and you can deploy additional ones very easily. And you can run lots of them. And you may have an appliance that only takes five terabytes handling a file system that is 500 terabytes or a petabyte. That is extremely attractive to anyone that's dealing with unstructured data because that's always the problem. Everyone knows the file systems are massive, but the active set is always very, very small, but you need tons of performance around that active set. Our architecture of constantly synchronizing, not tiering, but synchronizing against the object storage layer allows us to preserve the performance while shifting the problem of scale to the object storage layer. So let's get into that. Tom, if you show the next slide. So this is the core architecture so that we have context for everything we're going to talk about. The appliances, like I said, um, you know, they used to run on-prem. They used to run on uh, hardware. Uh, we still have about 30%, like Tom said, about 70% of our deployments for appliances today are all virtual. Uh, that's up from, I would say, that was 60% about a year ago. So it's moving very, very quickly to being just all virtual. And more and more of the appliances, uh, we still have deployments that are on-prem, but more and more of the deployments are all in the cloud. So we're spinning up those appliances. Our clients are spinning up those appliances, uh, those appliances in you know, EC2 or in Azure Compute or in Google, um, and then connecting the workloads there. UniFS still at the center of our universe. And then the other piece that I want to highlight here is the management console ties all that together so that the IT operator is looking really at one system always with all the appliances, no matter where they are in the world, when, no matter if they're in the cloud or where they are, and all the backend object storage also managed through the central console. And then number five, the analytics connector is what we really want to show you uh, this year because we are super excited. I mean, this is, 
it showcases what happens when you have a file system that lives in the object storage layer and you don't even need an appliance to be able to access the file system structure. All of a sudden you can perform massive scale operations on a file system at a speed and at a scale at a cost that is just unthinkable if you have to go through the appliance. You know, the, the, you know, if you think about synchronization, you know, one of the reasons we can do synchronization so well is because the object store is the hub for our synchronization structure. The same thing is true with the analytics connector. By making the object store directly accessible, we can open up access to data structures that are, you know, ridiculous to try to access, I mean, ridiculously large to try to access through any one appliance. Um, a problem that anyone that's ever done, you know, a, you know, search text indexing in a, in a large file system or try to do some kind of compliance and pull out social security numbers from the file system. You know, if, if there is a, if there is a hundred thousand files, that takes a while. If there are a billion files, that takes an impossible amount of time. So we are going after that part of the market where you have large scale and you want this, um, this, this sort of uh, analytics into the file system. All right, Tom, so next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let me show you three use cases, all very similar, all um, very uh, present, you know, all, all of them very much of this year and the changes that we've seen. You know, a lot of our clients, you know, everyone was sent home overnight. They had to figure out how to enable remote work remote access to all of their enterprise files. Um, you know, if you have, if you are an ELS network, you had a lot of pain uh, doing this, but if you were an SD-WAN or anything that was flexible, uh, one of the things that most of our clients were able to do overnight was shift the access points of their enterprise file systems from the on-prem infrastructure where a lot of our appliances used to be directly to cloud regions and have the end users access their files directly to a local cloud region where an appliance was running and having access to the same file system because the file system is never in the appliance, it's always in the cloud, in the object storage layer. So, you know, this was, this was a lifeline to many people that all of a sudden were sent home and had to keep working from home. Hey, Andres. This is that's... also, go ahead, Ray. So. Yeah. I... <laughs> the, the file system supports local cloud access to some data that's sitting someplace else. Is that is that what? Where's the object data in the the uni, UniFS in this in this sort of solution? Is you it? No, it can be it can be anywhere, right? So it could be on the same cloud provider in the same region, or more likely, it's on a different region than the object store, but on the same cloud provider, or it could be in a different provider. You know, if you happen. You need to support, um, you know, you need to support Beijing, and you can only find a, a local provider to Beijing. You can you can spin up the appliance there, add that provider's compute layer, and tie it all the way back to say an S3 bucket that's sitting in Seattle. Ah, and so okay. exactly, that's nice. let, 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 right. what is what is game changing is the ability to spin up that appliance very quickly and gain access to the hundreds of terabytes that are in the file system in whatever, you know, it, wherever you need it. Okay. Exactly. All it's right. the speed to deployment and being able to, you know, like we, so we recently closed a, a very large pharmaceutical call, uh, um, company, you know, all NetApp, huge shift from NetApp to Nasuni. One, the number one winning proposition was the speed to be able to deploy storage anywhere in the world, hundreds of terabytes. Like with Nasuni, all you need to do is you, you set up the appliance, you spin up the VM, it's there. You have unlimited storage at that location, right? With traditional storage, you actually have to build a 150 terabyte array and the best of the traditional players are gonna get you there in three or four months. We can do that overnight. So that ability to just, not just move access, not just deploy access to the file system from anywhere, but deploy essentially the entire infrastructure stack for storage, you know, a full NFS mount or a full SIF share anywhere where you can put as many files as you want, it's incredibly valuable. Um, this strategy, by the way, Ray, so, so when you look at this strategy, this was kind of a, an immediate correction that many companies had to do when, when everyone was sent home. 
but it is more and more a strategy that I think CIOs are pursuing in the long term. In other words, they're collapsing physical infrastructure at their sites, putting good pipes in their physical sites, and then just having a local cloud region that has a high-speed connection to those local sites. And so you end up serving the files from these local cloud appliances and eliminating all of the need for extra infrastructure other than networking at your local sites. So I actually think we're gonna see a reduction in terms of number of physical sites and an increase in the levels of performance and footprint of cloud region sites, regional sites, you know, like, and this is, you know, very popular with say like our construction uh, accounts, our media accounts that have, you know, hundreds of sites around the world. And traditionally they've been running an appliance on every one of those sites. Now, you know, you, you can get a one to five reduction in terms of number of appliances by collapsing upwards towards the public cloud and then have the object store wherever it happens to be. Yes, is there another question? I have a question about the backend. I mean, uh, it's really clear on the front end, but actually in the backend, you, you support multiple object stores and there are, for example, issues with, uh, you know, uh, data sovereignty. So I want to be sure yes. that, you know, all the data ends uh, in, a, you know, in a specific region or I need to migrate data from region to the, to the other. Yes. So do you support all this management feature in the backend? Because consolidation Absolutely. is a part of the job, Absolutely. but actually management in the, yes. in the long term becomes an issue if you have terabytes. I agree, I agree. So. And, 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 you know, so we, you know, we support global deployments of file systems, right? Global file systems for companies that are operating all over the world. Like you said, one of the big um, requirements is to be able to have data sovereign, you know, to be able to localize data in, in a world where supposedly data is out there in the cloud everywhere. Because of that, one of the things that we allow for is not only can the appliances be deployed anywhere on-prem or, or across any one of the providers, but the backend, when you create a volume, you can localize that volume to any one of your providers. You can, so you could be AWS, you could be Microsoft, you could be Google. All of it is available to you through the management console. And not only that, when you pick a provider, the next menu down that you get are all of the regional data centers for that provider. And so if you are in Germany and you want to make sure the data stays in Germany, you pick a region where the objects never leave Germany. And then if you don't want to share it around the world, you just don't share that volume to anywhere else around the world. So we're ensuring both, you know, this is a software layer that delivers the file systems that your organization needs to run. Uh, the, the, the engine behind that is all of the cloud providers. They're all available to you. All of the major cloud providers are available to you to basically deploy this around the world. And as we talk in the next slide, you'll see how even how how that's even more important. Um, as a uh, Tom, so if we go to the next one, this is this is one of my favorite use cases. So I think most of you have been doing IT for long enough to understand the the promise and then the miss delivery of BDI over the years. There's been two things that slow down the adoption of BDI, especially if there's any kind of performance workloads, like, like many of our clients, engineering, you know, architecture, things that require a lot of uh, UI interaction. Uh, first of all, is latency, right? As soon as you get farther than those 30, 40 milliseconds, BDI gets gummy and your designers or your engineers hate using it. The other one is the, the expense and the complexity of deployments because wherever you have that VDI front end, you need tons of resources applied to it. Um, we can see that the cloud, specifically the public cloud, has solved both of those issues, um, especially when you couple it with a global file system like ours. So what our clients are doing is they have, they're deploying VDI close to the offices where all the engineers and designers are working in cloud regions, such that they can stay within that 30, 40 millisecond interval. They use the cloud resources to you know, do multi-tenancy, 
to manage the resources so that you're never overpaying for resources, over provisioning the VDI banks. And then the synchronization across the regions happens because our file system is actually synchronizing the files across regions. This allows Reinvest. you to have a pure, go ahead. Uh, this is re real clear, but uh, uh, in this case, uh, it's just more uh, uh, something to the cloud and uh, is almost a cloud communication. I want to go back uh, in the previous slide uh, yes. where you talk about uh, also client uh, people that work at home and they connect yes. uh, through SMB directly to yep. a local cloud region in, with the edge. I guess with uh, SMB, with encryption like uh, Azure uh, files, for example, mm -hmm. is it true it using a encryption or something uh, similar? Yes, you encrypt all the connections to the cloud region. Okay. Absolutely. Makes sense. Yeah, and, and not only that, you know, one of the things that makes this model so powerful is that we never have a website presentation of this data. So, you know, when you go to Dropbox or Box or any one of those SaaS providers, right? They are actually looking at the data and you're trusting the company for the access to the data. We in a SUNY, we don't have any access to our customers' data because we never need to present it. We move the data behind the appliances. So the appliances are creating the encryption. The objects in the object store are encrypted at rest with our customer generated encryption keys. That is, we don't have those keys AWS or Microsoft doesn't have the keys. The only entity that has the keys is the customer, the client, right? In this case, you're absolutely right, Andrea. If you wanna to go to the cloud region, in addition, the communications between the branch office and the cloud region is encrypted as well. So yeah, and full this, encryption uh, all the way through. Yeah. Great. And uh, the communication uh, through the client uh, is uh, basically SMB communication. So. You don't need any type of uh, agent or gateway like Dropbox, for example, or Drive. Nothing. To this is because yes. it's a native communication, correct? Co correct. Perfect. Correct. Exactly. And you know the so the reason I like this, the, you know, I chose this. I wanted to show you guys these three scenarios. Is that there's sort of you know like if you're an IT operator, these are the things you would think through if you want to change access to the data. It's like okay, the most basic thing is I just enable close regional access points, and then anyone can come from home and anyone can come if they're at the branch office, eventually they can come straight to that cloud region instead of going to that local, you know, appliance that was sitting there in yeah. that office before. You know, we have seen massive yeah. engineering firms transform to this access met method, you know, in a week. It's very easy to do. There's no agents, there's nothing else that you need to add to the solution. The VDI one Great. gives you more, go ahead. Andrea. Yeah, yeah, the VDI uh, one is more for high performance, but it requires more investment. Go ahead. Sure. In this case, uh, uh, if uh, people uh, start back to, to moving uh, in case of uh, uh, Road Warrior uh, or the, this kind of uh, people, yeah, is, uh, is there a way uh, probably you can do with uh, Microsoft DFS or something similar, but uh, do you provide any way to find <laughs> found the, the local edge, the best edge yes. that can be used? Yes. Okay, great. Andrea, that is a very, that is a, we are, we and DFS have had a love affair for years, almost since the beginning. And that, what you just mentioned, you know, it's funny, just yesterday, I was, I was in a panel with one of our, our large, you know, older accounts. And I said, what's the number one reason why you why you moved to Nasuna? He said, "I I was just so tired of copying user user mounts from one place to another to another because all they had these road warriors that were going across locations. Nowadays, everything gets replicated. The, our file system keeps everything in replication. And when the users move, their DFS just reroutes them to the local appliance, and that turns out to be a really good strategy for road warriors that are going around the world." Um, and also for DR, like if you have an appliance fail in one location, DFS can take you to another location very quickly. So yes, we are tightly, and DFS namespaces is, is a terrific product. Uh, just like DFSR is a terrible product. Namespace is actually very good. 
Um, and then Tom, if you we show number two or number three, because I want to show you, uh, I think number three, right, Tom? This is kind of the, the best of two worlds, right? You can have SMB, you can have VDI, and you can mix, you can move between one world and the other. By the way, just like you can have a VDI, and there you can have one acceleration at the edge. And then you have to have a one acceleration client, but that's kind of an intermediate in terms of cost and complexity of deployment. The key to all of this magic is the fact that all I'm changing is the access to my file system. The file system is not moving. The file system is still in the same object store. I may have, you know, I may have, a, I may have 30 big file systems that are sitting across AWS, Azure, and Google, right? And they're mutually exclusive, 30 file systems across the providers. I may have a hundred of these appliances running on-prem, running in AWS, running in Azure, that are giving access to my users through different access paths to the system. And all of that is controlled centrally, and all of that, you don't have to back up, all of that has unlimited capacity. So that's the elegance of this approach. By separating the file system from the appliances, the appliances are just very easy to spin and give you access to the files. Andreas, um, uh, just one yes. question. So right. SMB3, obvious, is a VDI a different access protocol from your perspective? I, I guess no, I don't understand that. Uh, so the way you do it, Teray, is you, you built the VDI front end so that your VDI desktop is sitting, say, in AWS, say it's workspaces, right, in AWS. You spin up the Nasuni Edge appliance right there next to it in EC2. And now you have the stack. So you have one Nasuni Edge oh, appliance, and you may have 10, 20, 100 of workspaces instances, and then your users are logging onto that. Oh, what I wish we had a whiteboard right now. But yes, yeah, I think but, you got it. But the protocol yeah. between the VDI appliance and the, the SUNY appliance is still SMB3 or, or absolutely or, SMB3. Okay, I got you. I yes, got you. or NFS. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, so Tom, let's show the the clients. So because I want to give you a good example of this, this this is one of the things that that we started seeing. So major oil companies, uh, you know. Here is an example, but we have many other clients that we, we can't share publicly. If you look at the use cases for oil discovery, it's, it's, it's very, it's classic. And this is, Ray, back to your point, this is the place where because of the scale of the problem, we have a way of crushing the competition. Anyone that's trying to do this, whether it's Azure file, NetApp, anyone that tries with an appliance-based model, you know, with something that is basically the data is in the appliance, the thing about oil and gas is that you're always talking petabytes and petabytes of storage. So if you can leverage the object store, immediately the cost structure is just so favorable. You're talking about so many petabytes that, you know, if I can do it for a million instead of $10 million, that's, ex that's extremely attractive right away. In addition to that, uh, and Tom, if we go back to the previous slide, just so that I can show what, what happens. In addition to that, is say you have researchers in Texas that are doing a bunch of discovery work. They're doing analytical work on these VDI stations that are running very expensive applications like Petrel. And then you have a bunch of researchers that are doing the same sort of work in you know, Aberdeen, Scotland. And they need to collaborate. Those workloads together you know, are, oh, you're always talking hundreds of terabytes that need to be exchanged between those research groups. Our ability to do that with a cloud hub, an object store scale and cost structure, but also the ability to share all that data, not from appliance to appliance, but through the object store backbone of say an Azure or say an AWS, it's extremely beneficial to the clients. So not only are they getting all to the cloud, they're getting this sort of at scale collaborations of an application that you know has the, the performance and scale requirements that would typically need and only be met by local infrastructure, but then you can't share the data. So your ability to deploy not just remote working infrastructure, but interacting, you know, collaborative infrastructure, um, it's it's game changing to these big companies. A couple uh, of questions involving big files. Um, Go ahead, Barry. 
obviously during the coronavirus pandemic, everyone's kind of gone out there and had to find ways of work. And I appreciate those customers that had VDI, getting the data local yeah. to where those VDI desktops be, that's great. But we saw lots of people picking up their workstations and heading home to go and try and work from home using VPNs and things like that. Just to confirm your yes. solution doesn't have any client side ability to improve their file experience just when simply they're working from their their device at home without a local data center appliance nearby in the office near them and the second thing about uh, file locking when you're spreading a file system so uh, geographically you generally end up with a problem with not knowing who's in what file uh, yes. has someone updated it in china before it's managed to sync in russia or something like that how do you get around those problems right. Yes. So the, I'll start with your second question because that, that one is, is technically a, a formidable question. So file locking across locations, you're absolutely right. If you are going to enable file locking across multiple locations, you have to be able to undo the locks. You have to be able to release the locks because it can always be the case that someone leaves something locked, just like in a regular you know file server, and then you have to manually go in and release it. That management console that gives you central control allows you to release locks that are kept anywhere in the world. Um, and that's that's really important. And, and you know, it's it's a, it's like it's a non-starter if you cannot control the locks from a central kind of management interface to, to the whole system to be able to, to manage the locks. Um, our sort of primary access point is what you're seeing here, but we also, and I'll let Ross uh, fill in later on this, we also have a client side product that we develop through partnerships to allow for an unlock mode because the, the, your two questions are actually related Barry. It's, it's very very difficult to extend the lock all the way to the client and not end up in a real mess of lots and lots of things that are kind of you know hitting the system from with the wrong semantics and so one of the things that we've done is we we kind of have a a client side sync client that uh, I think client that enables um, enables that sort of access for the case where people really want to have local files. So a great example of something that works really well is, as you know, probably home directories. Anything that I'm just sharing with myself is really good as a use case for 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 sync for the part for the sync part of sync and share because there's no cross mess with the locks and trying to share with other people. I, you know, I'm of the belief that sharing happens in two ways. Either you have it in an application like SharePoint or Teams where the application is controlling the workflow, or you have it at the infrastructure level where you have things like NFS and SIFS locks that are controlling the interaction. I think those worlds don't like too much to interact with one another without, without making a big mess. Then you can have APIs across those two worlds, but really one product that spans the gamut is very difficult to get the experience right. Well, we have learned that painfully over the years. Um, Thomas, next slide, so I can talk about the, the, the next uh, two slides. There you go. This one, I wanted to show you because it's, a, it's very different than the um, than oil uh, exploration. So this is a media company that uh, SDL is, you know, it's a very large media company. It has about 1,500 virtual desktops, so these VDI desktops that have been spun as Amazon workspaces. But what's what's fun about it is that the workflow tying these workspaces together actually orchestrates the movement of the files as the files need to be worked on around the world. So you may have design stuff happening in London. And then you have the rendering piece or the finishing stuff is happening in somewhere, you know, I don't know, in Caracas, that's where I come from. And then the third stage is done somewhere else. Not only are the files being moved behind these VDI workstations so that they're close to the region where they need to be worked, but there is an API-based interaction to our management console between that and JIRA that is automatically triggering all of the right tickets and as the movement of the files is happening so that people in those locations know that the work has arrived and that their workstation is ready for them to build the next thing. I believe that we will see more and more, you definitely will see from us, more and more of this sort of intelligent file system interaction with SaaS, where the file system sends triggers, for instance, 
to the SaaS applications that the payload has arrived, that the payload is ready. And then something like Jira is actually updating its ticket states so that people can conduct work. And we, you know, this is an area that we are very interested in. We're interested in that, that relationship between file system activity and SaaS applications that can be driven from it. You know, a, a, a standard one would be, um, you know, something like ServiceNow, right, for self-provisioning. Jira is a far more kind of high level one where you're actually trying to coordinate workloads, uh, workflows, I'm sorry, across different teams in different regions of the world that involve, you know, 10 to hundreds of terabytes of file payloads. So think, think big, because uh, that's what infrastructure is for. So based, um, on, based on that example, uh, Andreas, um, I'm, I'm assuming you guys have some type of API. Uh, uh, do you have an API structure that plugs into that as well? Yes, Jason. Great to see you. Yes, absolutely. So we have an API. And the wonderful thing about this API is that it connects to the management console. So you get one place where you hook, say, Jira, and then the entire system is under control and the entire system is sending you events that you can use to trigger the state changes in Jira. Very good. So, nice. Absolutely, yeah. This is modern file systems, right? It's all API based and you're driving interactions both ways. Um, very good, Tom. I think that may be it. And I'm happy to take more questions now or later, or we can have beers later. Yeah, I would just add, Andreas, that SDL was a cool example because I think they did this switch over, like you said, they went from everybody working on-prem, connecting to appliances that were also located in their offices uh, to right. full workspaces in the cloud with appliances moved into EC2 within, I think it was 10 days, right? It was really short. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and to your point, I mean, this, the speed at which you can deploy these things. Right? Yeah. Right. The, the, here's the key, because you don't have to move the data. All you're doing is you're opening access, more access, more performance, more locations, more cloud regions, but you're not moving the files. I know Ray knows a lot about this. Moving the files is what takes for bloody ever. Like especially when you're talking hundreds of terabytes, you are now, you've changed the, the time dimension of the problem. And this is the thing that I think everyone that is, you know, been looking at unstructured data you know, we focus on performance, we focus on availability, but the thing that's often missed is, you know, whether you have a cluster or whether you have a very large array, when you're, when you're talking about hundreds of terabytes, you never ever wanna move that data. You wanna have an architecture that allows you to extend the access to that data and change the performance profile without moving it. And that's also, I think, why you've used the analogy in the past. It's like Akamai, right? It's taking the, the content that's needed and you're kind of moving it anywhere. It's you know, just, just what's needed. You're caching it Absolutely. Near, nearby. Absolutely. And it's no coincidence that our chief architect was the chief architect of Akamai Streaming. As a good Boston company, we like to steal from each other. But yes, Tom, absolutely. It's very much like Akamai. Let the objects distribute themselves, but you don't move that. Don't move the file system. Yeah, do you help customers with cost control? I mean, considering everything is in the cloud, I mean, egress is 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 a is a new cost, right, to users, and it's probably easy for them just to keep on reading from the cloud without realizing. Yes, Frederick, excellent question. That that is actually that that they came up. Um, so let me talk about the file system. The, the file system is is self cooling. So think about the way the file system works. Is when you're writing changes to it, every single change, every delta to the file system becomes a new immutable object in the object store. That means that we never go back and modify old objects in order to recreate what the present should look like. All of our customers, because of that, are running on cool storage. And very much like Tom said, about 98.5% of the access never, never goes across our edge appliance and into the object store layer, creating an egress cost for that. So the interactions between the edge appliances and the object store are always in what you, know, what you could describe accurately as cool mode. In other words, we are right into the object store and hardly ever coming back, unless you're synchronizing from another region and then it's just a delta. It's just a dedupe a delta that's being pulled out from, from the other region. The exception to this 
as in this may be what what more what your question is is like if you're running vdi if you're running vdi you're going to have traffic to that vdi workbench and that is something that you're going to have to manage with enough network and enough you know that is going to the, the cloud provider is going to charge for that but you know you're getting a tremendous service for that right you're getting a, a full desktop environment that you can access somewhere else not in your office Right, but the object store is is a cool interaction. Right, yeah, it's just a so, shift of cost, right? It's just people need to realize that instead of buying physical infrastructure, they end up with something much more flexible. But the costs are coming from different angle. Yes, yeah, they're yes. coming from it. Well, and, 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 I, and the costs are much much lower. Go yeah. ahead, Tom. I, I was actually I was going to say the same thing. That's been one of our our biggest challenges, Frederick, is making sure our customers understand what the equation is. And understanding that you know it's Nasuni plus cloud object storage plus egress fees is less than you know buying more primary NAS and file servers, backup software, backup tape and disk, media servers, disaster recovery infrastructure, uh, WAN acceleration to synchronize files across the network, uh, you know replicated copies, snapshots. So that, that's been our our challenge is to just make sure they understand what that equation is. And that was why we, we drew that picture before, I think, an Ann's presentation that showed the right. cost of, of object storage in the SUNY is typically about half half uh, the cost right. of refreshing that entire on-prem environment because of all that goes into it. Uh, but by just, the way, that, you're right. If you just compare us to a NetApp yeah. array, it, we're not going to be less. But when you compare it to everything else around that, our cost is less. Right. And, and the, the big change this year, the big change in the last two years, is that when you talk about these cloud-only environments, the equation, if, you, if you're a customer of any significant size, so say you have you know, 100 terabytes or more of storage, the equation of whether those 100 terabytes are sitting in the object storage layer and you're able to access it through small appliances in the compute layer versus having the appliances in the compute layer have this 100 terabytes of storage, there is no comparison. So as customers move their entire environment to the cloud, the inability to run natively the file system in the object storage layer is, is turn the economics even more in the favor of the architecture that we give people access to. That's, you know, for, when you talk about, I talked about this in the oil and gas companies, when you're talking about petabytes, it's, it's almost laughable what the delta is between trying to do something with, say, a NetApp infrastructure in Azure versus Nasuni in Azure. They, they don't, it doesn't compute. You know, it takes us sometimes several cycles uh, during negotiations for people to really grasp that we're talking about the same thing, but at a fraction of the cost.